each and every one of you for coming together here on our third Aspen Grove, July 19th, 2020. And for those of you who are watching this video after the fact, welcome. For those of you who are coming in via Zoom, welcome. We're so glad that you're all here. And we just are trusting that God, who is not bound by time and space, will be able to meet you with the heart intentions of our gathering here this morning. Let me just open our time in prayer and we'll begin with a time of worship, a reading, an encouragement, and then a couple of prompts that will help kind of guide your conversation as you begin to tell just deeper parts of your story here together. So let me pray. Jesus, thank you so much for all the ways that you're moving. And we ask, Lord, that you would come now and mark this time and mark this space with the tangible presence of your Holy Spirit as you embrace each person with the Father's love. We consecrate this time and this space unto you. We declare that it's holy because you are holy and you're here. So we thank you for your light that drives out all forms of darkness. We thank you for your love that displaces all fear and brings in the good, healing, and powerful presence of your Spirit. Lord, we give you this morning. We thank you for it. And we pray all this in your strong name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, enjoy your time of worship. Good morning. Hope you all are doing well this morning. Press on 
mountains that I face every season, I will press on for God.
lose sight of his goodness. When we look around, so many things that are difficult, bad, evil, dark. Set your eyes on him and his goodness. He's the light of the world. to be a light to the world as well. We've got to be looking at them so that we can be that light.
morning I'm going to read the entirety of Isaiah 40. It's a little long. I encourage you to go back and read it for yourself. Here we go. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem. Tell her that her sad days are gone and her sins are pardoned. Yes, the Lord has punished her twice over for all her sins. Listen, it's the voice of someone shouting, clear the way through the wilderness for the Lord. Make straight highways through the wasteland for our God. Fill in the valleys and level the mountains and hills. Straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. The Lord has spoken. A voice said, shout. I asked, what should I shout? Shout that people are like the grass. Their beauty fades as quickly as the flowers in a field. The grass withers and the flowers fade beneath the breath of the Lord. And so it is with people. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord stands forever. O Zion, messenger of good news, shout from the mountaintops. Shout it louder, O Jerusalem. Shout and do not be afraid. Tell the towns of Judah, your God is coming. Yes, the sovereign Lord is coming in power. He will rule with a powerful arm. See, he brings his reward with him as he comes. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will carry the lambs in his arms, holding them close to his heart. He will gently lead the mother sheep with their young. Who else has held the ocean in his hand? Who has measured off the heavens with his fingers? Who else knows the weight of the earth or has weighed the mountains and hills on a scale? Who is able to advise the Spirit of the Lord? Who knows enough to give him advice or teach him? Has the Lord ever needed anyone's advice? Does he need instruction about what is good? Did someone teach him what is right or show him the path of justice? No, for all the nations of the world are but a drop in the bucket. They are nothing more than dust on the scales. He picks up the whole earth as though it were a grain of sand. All the wood of Lebanon's forests and all Lebanon's animals would not be enough to make a burnt offering worthy of our God. The nations of the world are worth nothing to him. In his eyes they count for less than nothing, mere emptiness and froth. To whom can compare God? What image can you find to resemble him? Can he be compared to an idol formed in a mold overlaid with gold and decorated with silver chains? Or if people are too poor for that, they might at least choose wood that won't decay and a skilled craftsman to carve an image that won't fall down. Haven't you heard? Don't you understand? Are you deaf to the words of God, the words he gave before the world began? Are you so ignorant? God sits above the circle of the earth. The people below seem like grasshoppers to him. He spreads out the heavens like a curtain and makes his tent from them. He judges the great people of the world and brings them all to nothing. They hardly get started, barely taking root when he blows on them and they wither. The wind carries them off like chaff. To whom will you compare me? Who is my equal? Ask the Holy One. Look up into the heavens who created all the stars. He brings them out like an army, one after another, calling each by its name. Because of his great power and incomparable strength, not a single one is missing. O oh, Jacob, how can you say the Lord does not see your troubles? O oh, Israel, how can you say God ignores your rights? Have you never heard, have you never understood the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth? He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired. Even young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles.
They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. I hope you have a great day. Well, it's good to be here. I'm actually on a beautiful piece of property just outside of Divide. Just want to thank Kevin and Sandra for their hospitality and letting me use this space in front of one of their cabins. And because I'm outside, you'll probably hear birds or wind chimes or jets flying over, who knows. But uh, we'll just keep it real and we'll just kind of enter into a time of encouragement here that will lead us into some prompts. And I'm kind of flying off the cuff here. I have no notes. And so, you know, it's kind of fun to watch a tightrope walker without a net. But at least I have Mark Bovey to help edit these things if I mess it up too bad. So listen, the encouragement that I want to bring to you this morning, it comes from really a tag off of last time that we've gathered. And the last time that we gathered, I brought this idea that we live on the earth, we're surrounded by an atmosphere, I guess we could call that the first heaven. So we have first heaven and then there's reference in scripture of you know, powers and principalities and rulers of this dark ages. That we have these incredible stories of angelic beings that are at war with one another and angels and demons. And I know that for a lot who have not been raised up with a spiritual mindset, more of an empirical worldview, that the idea of spiritualism like that, where there's angels and demons and there's um, rulers that have influence on human beings um, for some that's a real stretch you know for others uh, we've come to realize that there's a reality that is beyond our five senses that is beyond our natural world and I suppose that's what we would call super or beyond natural the supernatural um, for those of you who may have been raised up or have studied, you know, different, um, you know, maybe different philosophies or different religions, uh, you might see this more as a, a, a beyond the physical, a meta or beyond the physical. So a metaphysical, regardless of what language you put on it, um, I believe that there are two distinct um realms that we navigate through simultaneously as human beings on the planet. We live in this physical place. We have physical bodies with physical senses. And then we have this spiritual reality that is, um, it's beyond our, like our scope. It's like we have um, the ability to see certain colors, you know, like the colors of the rainbow. And on one end, the colors that escape our ability to perceive those would be like ultraviolet and on the other end of the spectrum we would have infrared and so just because we can't see them doesn't mean that that does not exist it's the same with our hearing we have uh, subsonic or supersonic and there's different frequencies that our human ears cannot perceive and I believe that all of our physical senses are limited to a point and every so often we will have this intersection of the physical and the spiritual that become, I, I guess, just uh, very clear to us. So um, that when that happens, I've referred to it, and I know others in their writings have referred to it as a, a thin veil. When the veil that separates the physical world and the unseen world of the supernatural um, gets very thin, and there are th things that, um, you know, that are happening in the spiritual that we become aware of in, in the physical. And I love that. And I think that's part of what Jesus is, you know, doing on the earth. He's, he's helping us engage uh, both the reality of what's happening on the earth and the reality of what's happening in the realm of the spirit. I say all that to say that uh, there's this powerful encouragement in Hebrews where we're told to fix our eyes on the things above. Now, above you know when i grew up we always thought that heaven was up there you know so things above 
um, referring to things of heaven. Well, I, I would actually um, argue that the, the passage is actually encouraging us to fix our eyes on the realm of the Spirit and not simply on the temporal world, not simply on the, the things that we can perceive with our physical senses, but grow a tune grow attuned to what's going on in the realm of the spirit. And then I brought that encouragement last time that we were together, where if we're going to engage problems or issues, or if we're going to bring solution to the first world uh, that we live in, in first heaven, and we do not want to do that under the influence of powers and principalities of this dark age, if we do not want to be influenced by the spirit of the age, but rather be kingdom people that bring an influence of God's kingdom, well, then we have to look beyond the second heaven and we have to engage life as people who are living, feet firmly planted on the ground, and yet our spirits are united with the spirit of Christ and we are seated with him in heavenly places. So for us, to bring heavenly solution to earthly problems without the interference of a second heaven like agenda to bring harm, to, to steal, to kill, to destroy, to bring division, all of that stuff that's happening in the realm of the spirit that um, is influencing human beings on the planet. If we want to be people, well, if we want to be people of the way, the way of Jesus, then we're encouraged to connect with Jesus in the place of the third heaven, in the place of our like um, position in Christ. And so this morning's encouragement is actually a question of how can we cultivate that attunement? How can we cultivate the ability? Sorry, uh, how can we cultivate the ability to know more accurately what's going on in the place of third heaven. Well, that's super subjective unless you first and foremost lay the foundation of the scripture. Like, read the scripture. Put the word of God in your heart. Meditate on the word of God. Let the word of God in its written form, let the logos be written on your heart as it says in the new covenant, like I will write my word upon your heart. I will write my word upon your mind so that you will not go astray, so that you will not sin. And so for us to be people who are growing attuned to the, to the reality of the spirit life that we have with Christ, we have to come to the word. We have to come to the scripture. And as we grow and build on the foundation of God's word, we begin to understand that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's this living component to the word that brings us into a a simultaneous priority to have intimate relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit in real time with the foundation of the word being our safeguard And so to cultivate life in the spirit, to have a sense of what's going on in the third heaven as it's supported by the word, as it is like really founded upon the truths of God's word, we have some things that we can do as God's people to cultivate that deep knowing of the spirit life. And um, and so I'm going to just reference one chapter of the Bible really to help create the uh, the encouragement here. And that's the chapter of 1 Corinthians 14. Now we know 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. It's all about love. And 1 Corinthians 14 begins with saying, follow the way of love and eagerly desire all of the spiritual gifts especially the gift of prophecy. And then he goes on, Paul, who wrote this book, you know, Corinthians, he wrote this to the church in Corinth. And he goes on in that chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, 
to do a comparison contrast between the gift of the prophetic and the gift of speaking in tongues. Now, one of the things that Paul makes very clear is that speaking in tongues is praying with your spirit directly to the Spirit of God. So it's like your spirit man who is unencumbered by the filters of our mind, by the miscommunications, by the limitations of our thinking. Your spirit that is united with Christ is communing and praying, speaking to God directly when you speak in tongues. Now, the words speak in tongues bring with them like just whole maybe a whole bunch of baggage that uh, some people carry around with that and you hear me say speaking in tongues and some of you might be ready to run out the door uh, screaming ah but others of you are like oh finally he's going to start talking about speaking in tongues actually what I want to do is I want to bring the emphasis on the prayer Speaking in tongues, to me, is a capacity in my spirit to communicate directly to the Father. Now, we know that prayer is a two-way thing, right? It's communication, so it's back and forth. And this is where we find some real encouragements, because not only is my spirit man speaking directly to the Father, but the Father can be speaking directly to my spirit, to me. And my mind has the capacity to understand or interpret what the spirit is praying and what the spirit is saying to me. So if I want to cultivate an attunement to what's happening in the third heaven, and I have the foundation of the word that is supporting me and that is helping safeguard me from going off willy-nilly into the tall weeds and getting lost out there somewhere, then I have the capacity to commune with God through my spirit and to receive from God through my spirit. And then my mind has the ability to interpret and then to understand what's going on in the third heaven in the realm of the spirit me being seated with christ to know his heart and his mind sorry about the breeze here we're getting a little wobbly so hey this is really fascinating to me because um as i said last time there's a lot of us who have been tempted to just think merely as human beings and not to remember that we have this capacity to commune and to connect more deeply with God in the place of our spirit and understand his big story and then be informed by that and make our decisions and make our claims and make our proclamations and make whatever it is we're going to make um, inspired by the spirit. So we're spiritual people. And as spiritual people, we want to be living in the spirit. We want to be living in communion with the Spirit and in step with the Spirit. And I can't find any greater source of connecting me spirit to spirit than with that gift, that prayer language that is direct. And so this is where Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 just does a fantastic job of kind of contrasting. He's like, look, the prophetic, that's amazing. You're getting a sense of God's heart and his mind. And you're able to communicate that to the body of Christ in their native language in a way that they understand it. And I would much rather you do that because it's going to build the entire group up when you're in a public gathering. Let's do that. If you're in a public gathering and you have a tongue, like a, a if you want to pray in tongues or speak in tongues, then... Um, Hey, let's make sure that we have some interpretation so that what is being prayed in tongues could be spoken in the native language of all the people that are in the room. So everybody actually has an encouragement and they're strengthened by that instead of just looking at you like you're crazy. Paul says, look, I speak in tongues more than any of you, but I would rather come into a public gathering 
and speak just a few intelligible words in the native language of everybody there than to speak, you know, 10,000 words in a tongue. The whole point is about building people up. But he goes on to say that praying in the Spirit, praying in tongues, builds you up, builds you as an individual up. And so, you know, there's no greater encouragement than having communion with Jesus and having that communion from spirit to spirit I mean that builds you up that just gives you strength and so that's that's really what I wanted to kind of point to and I wanted to point to this gift this gift of praying in the spirit speaking in tongues to me they're one and the same just a different way of saying the same thing Um, and I wanted to bring that to mind because I think this is a practical help for us now for those of you who have never spoken in tongue, this may not feel very practical. But this is why we get to encourage one another in these small group settings. And by encourage, I don't mean force anything. And by encourage, I don't mean like uh, gang up on somebody who doesn't speak in tongues. <laughs> That's not encouraging. Uh, by encouraging, I mean like just saying, look, this is a safe place. For us to pray for you if you've never had that experience. Or maybe you've prayed for this 20 times in the past 20 years. I don't know. Maybe you've been asking for this for decades and it hasn't come to you yet. Um, I don't really have the answers to why that is other than I do like the idea that when, um, you know, because the Holy Spirit's sometimes referred to as like wine. Like if you bottled something of wine and you put it into a wine cellar, and you marked it as reserved, like there's a reserve where that wine is not to be open until a certain date, because then it would be the most flavorful, it would be the most like full bodied, it would be the most rich at that date. Uh, maybe there are some things that God um, waits until there's certain times before he, you know, opens that up for us. Um, maybe, I know in my case, maybe I'm just trying too hard with my mind and remember this is spirit to spirit and sometimes we just need to be reminded that you're not going to lose control you're not going to like absolutely have no ability to control this in fact what's really crazy is the first time this ever happened with me I was literally driving up Bluebird Hill you know coming out of Woodland Park towards Divide Bluebird Hill I'm driving in my 1972 Chevy Nova I got my hair parted down in the middle, feathered back. You know, I got my my good look, you know, from the 80s going. And I had been asking the Lord for this gift for several months. And my sincerity was this. God, I want everything that you have for me, period. And so I was driving up, listening to the radio. I was probably listening to some Christian music, the Garmo and Key or something like that. And so I remember the Lord saying, just turn off your radio and just start praising me. And I started praising him. And then all of a sudden, what started to flow out of my mouth was a language that I had never learned. And it sounded so weird to me. And the first thought in my head was, am I making this up? And so I stopped. And then I started again, praying in the spirit. And then I stopped and I started and I stopped and I started that whole the whole process was completely under control i can do it or not do it so uh that's one of the fears i think a lot of people have and so it's a little bit of a um a roadblock for some but i also know that there's you know the fear of like losing control and being totally out of control here's the deal you know brian said it last week he quoted that scripture it says which one of you fathers even though you're sinful, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give you the Holy Spirit if you ask? And so just remember that the words for spiritual gift is really the spirituals. It's the gifts. It doesn't translate well in English, so they just use spiritual gifts. But there's one spiritual gift, and that's the Holy Spirit. And he parses out all of these gifts for various reasons. And I would say that the church, we as the people have an opportunity to engage the gift of praying in the spirit, the gift of tongues for the sake of cultivating an attunement to what's going on in third heaven. 
what's going on in the heart and the mind of Jesus. Because remember, the encouragement is this, that in our weakness, when we don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes through us, sometimes with groanings. And so maybe it's just a groaning, but sometimes it's in a language of the Spirit that you were not taught, but only by the Holy Spirit. And this is my final thought here before I close it up. Paul would pray this, God, as I pray in the Spirit, give my mind the ability to interpret what my spirit is praying so that I can pray not only with my spirit, but also with my mind. So yes, the gift of speaking in tongues is an encouragement for us. It builds us up and it's probably most potent when we gain an interpretation of what's going on in the spirit with our minds. So we pray in the Spirit, and this is often how I'll do it. I'll pray in the Spirit, and I'll pause, and then I'll pray in English as my mind gets an interpretation. And it's by faith that I'm believing, Jesus, you're going to be the one that's going to help me interpret this accurately. And the more I do it, the more I practice it, the more there's a flow between Spirit and my mind, Spirit and my mind. But remember, it's the Spirit that is leading this show and not the mind. Uh, the mind is a better student than it is a teacher in this case. All right. So with that, I'm going to just simply pause and we'll allow for the prompts to come. Okay, so the prompts for uh, this Aspen Grove here is really the first one is just the, a prompt to tell you more of your story and as it pertains in particular to the spiritual gifts um, what has been your experience in church um, is this a frightening conversation for you is this an encouragement for you is this something that you're very familiar with it's, you know we all come from different backgrounds and different stories and I think it's a real um, it's a real testament to God to just bring us along in a process and I just want your conversation to be full of grace as you're listening and as you're asking open-ended questions about people's journeys related specifically to the spiritual gifts and more particularly to the gift of speaking in tongues or praying in the spirit. So that's the first prompt, big one, right? Um, and the second uh, prompt is really less about a question, but I guess it is. It's like who, who would want to receive prayer? For this gift without any expectation that you're going to perform without any expectation that there's a uh, a thing that has to happen here this morning uh, just remember my story uh, I had asked for it in public settings a lot I had received prayer for this a lot it didn't happen it didn't happen and it didn't happen until I was in a private place with the Lord and worship was kind of the on-ramp for that for me. And so you may have a similar story with that. So God bless you and your conversations, and God bless you. And I uh, just pray that you have a fantastic day the rest of your day. We'll see you soon.